Good morning. Good morning. And welcome in the name of our coming Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The days draw near for our celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as he comes, we know that he comes with mercy, peace, and forgiveness to bring to us sinners. But as we hear his word, we are convicted of our sin. And yet we rejoice, knowing that he has come not in judgment, but as our Savior, to take away the guilt of that sin and to give us the free gift of everlasting life in heaven. This morning, our Lord comes to us in both word and sacrament using divine service setting three as printed in the bulletin with our Advent omissions during the penitential season of Advent. And as we gather in the presence of the one true and triune God, we look to our baptism, where God himself called us by name, washed us clean of all of our guilt, and declared us to be his own dear beloved child. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. But my people did not listen to my voice. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for this, the second Sunday in Advent, which serves as the text for a sermon this morning, comes from the prophet Malachi, the third chapter. 
Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. This is the word of the Lord. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. For salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, the first chapter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And this is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel comes to us according to St. Luke, the third chapter. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. 
and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. Let us confess together our Christian faith as we speak the words of the Nicene Creed as printed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the countdowns have officially begun. All across the nation, people are anxiously keeping track as the days slowly tick by. Walmart associates update the sign by the door. Advent calendars are slowly being peeled back. And children are daily asking Siri and Alexa, how many days until Christmas? Here in the church, we're lighting a new candle on the Advent wreath each week. And our readings are building up to our glorious celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. Everyone is looking forward to Christmas. Because that's something to look forward to, isn't it? Jesus Christ, holy and perfect God, took on human flesh and descended to earth to be born of the Virgin Mary. The promised Messiah that we waited for for so long is finally coming to us. This is a reason to celebrate, to decorate the nation, to throw parties and sing songs and get together for joy and merriment. Christmas is when we celebrate the arrival of God himself. And that's something we should all really be looking forward to. Or is it? You know, let's set aside the fun and the parties and the razzle-dazzle of Christmas for a moment. Let's look beyond the gifts and the get-togethers and the goodies, and let's take an honest look at what Christmas is really about. And then let's ask the question, are you really looking forward to Jesus' arrival? Do you really want Jesus to come to you? Because think about this. You are a sinner, and he is perfection. In the Bible, when people even see God, or even the holiness of angels, their response is not, whoa, cool, man. It's fear. It's terror. It is dread. It is a deep-seated knowing that you are unworthy and that your sin deserves only judgment and destruction. This is something that we oftentimes forget. And we need a stark reminder. We need the sternness of God's law. We need the forerunner of Jesus to wake us up and to make us realize what the arrival of Jesus actually means. And that's the purpose that John the Baptist served. John comes ahead of Jesus not to sing silly songs, wear a fuzzy hat, and put tinsel and glitter on everything. G, or John comes to cleanse, to uproot, to stir the pot and disrupt everything. His was a message of conviction and repentance, to wake people up, to make them realize that all the things that they had become comfortable with were sinful and filthy and wrong and did not belong in the presence of God. He comes to lay low the mountains of self-righteousness, to fill in the valleys of greed and, righteous and selfishness, to make straight the ways of man that have become so very crooked with sin. And that's just John. That's just the forerunner. When Jesus himself comes into your life, look how Malachi describes it. He says, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. What John began to make straight, what John stirred up, Jesus comes to purify, 
to cleanse, to remove all the impurities completely. Have you ever seen a video of a steel refinery? Have you ever seen how they take scrap and make it back into pure steel? There's this big old crucible. It's this tub that's filled up with all kinds of scrap metal, old washing machines and cars and terminators, things that can't be used anymore, but certainly aren't pure steel. And it's all heated up like crazy. It is melted down so that it's not even what it used to be anymore. And as it's melted and changed, all the impurities, all the stuff that's not what they want, it gets burned off or it floats up to the top to be scraped away and discarded. That's what it means to be refined. And that's what Jesus does in our lives. He burns away the sin. He melts us down to change us, to remove the dross and the impurities, and to make us into something new and far better than what we were. And that's a painful process. It hurts to have that sin that we've become so comfortable with burned and removed from our lives. We love taking God's name in vain. It's become a part of who we are. We love gossiping about our neighbor and bad-mouthing them behind their back. We truly enjoy the lust that rages in our hearts, the jealousy and envy, the grudges that we hold against our neighbor. Our anger and laziness and greed, it's all so deeply rooted within us. It's who we are, and we like it, and we have come to enjoy it. That's just the way we were made, we say. And hey, compared to our neighbor, we're not nearly as bad as them, so it's all good. But when Jesus comes into your life, he comes with a refiner's fire with a washer's soap to scrub out the stains and the impurities, to burn out the dross, to break you down from what sin has made you and reform you and purify you. And that process isn't pleasant. It's deeply painful as those parts of your life that have been with you for so long, those things that everyone else is doing, those things that seem like they're so fun and enjoyable as those things are ripped out of you. That's what happens when Jesus comes. So are you sure that you want Jesus to come? Well, think about the alternative. It might not seem as hard, but while the refinement that Jesus brings can be painful, the pain of sin's eternal consequences are far, far worse. You know, that's the big lie of the devil. Sin convinces us that it's the good life, that it's easy, that it's fun, that it's just so much better if we just push aside God's laws, because those things are hard to do, and there's no reward for that. So if we just live for ourselves, do what the world is doing, just gratify everything that comes into our heart, well, that's the easy life, and it's good, and life will be so much better without those stuffy old rules. But it's a lie. Even now, living in sin makes our lives painful. When we live in greed, we are never satisfied with anything that we have. We keep wanting more and more and more, and once we get that, we see something else that's even shinier, and we want that as well. When we embrace our lust, we will never find satisfaction. When we live just gratifying all those base instincts that sin says, this is you, do it, do it, do it, do it. When we live gratifying those, we will never experience real joy, but just this constant animalistic drive to find more and more and more and more, thinking only of ourselves and destroying our own lives and the lives of those around us in the process. Sin promises joy and pleasure and ease, but it only enslaves us. It only takes us away from joy. It only drags us down to fill our lives with sorrow and chaos and suffering. All the while promising, no, no, if you just do it more, it's going to turn that corner and it'll be great. 
but it never is. And then, when Jesus comes in judgment, when he returns again on the last day, and we stand before his throne of judgment, judged by his law, whether we agree with it or not, if we cling to our sin, our pain will be never-ending. In heaven, there is no sin whatsoever, not even a little speck of it. So if we are holding on to our sin, if we refuse to let go of the dross and the impurity, if we live lives where we are proud of our sin, where we make sin our identity, then we have condemned ourselves and told God we don't want his forgiveness because we like our sin better. To be refined, though, to have that impurity removed, to let go of that dross and filth, it can be hard. It can be painful. But in the end, oh, what joy it brings to our lives. As Jesus refines and purifies us, he does it out of love to restore us, to make us better, to take away our sin. As our loving Heavenly Father, He does not want to see us suffer under the sin that we think we need and that we enjoy so much. And so He comes to drive that sin out of our lives, to show us a better way, to give us His law of holiness and sanctification. And when we live by that word, we're not earning God's grace. It's already been given to us by that very word. But we avoid so many earthly consequences. We avoid harming our friends and family in the ways that the world wants us to. Jesus comes to refine us for our own good. He doesn't come in judgment as we deserve. Listen to what else God says through the prophet Malachi. As he's talking about refining, as he's talking about coming to change those wicked ways that have become so ingrained within us. He says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. The only reason that we aren't just destroyed outright because of our sin, because that's what we deserve, but the only reason that we're not destroyed is because of God's steadfast, loving promise of forgiveness. He keeps his word when we don't. He made a promise when sin first entered that he would forgive, that he would send the Messiah to take that sin away. And even as we ignore that word and mock it and live lives completely contrary to it and say, eh, I don't need to be forgiven because the world says it's okay now. God still remembers his promise, and God still forgives. And so he comes to us to refine us, not to destroy us. And while it might be a painful process because of how deeply rooted in sin we are, it makes us better. It leads us to growth, to maturity, to living a sanctified life to living a life of constant witness to our children, to our friends, to our co-workers, to total strangers, as we shine out like a beacon of light in a world of darkness and filth. And ultimately, the pain that we might suffer as we are refined by God's word and the Holy Spirit in our lives, that pain is nothing compared to what he endured on our behalf. How is it that we can be Christians? How is it that we can live by God's word? Only because Jesus came to us. And he didn't come to us as a baby just to give us the warm fuzzies every December. He didn't come to us just to whip us into shape and teach us how to behave better and earn our own way to heaven. Jesus Christ, God himself, this tiny baby whose birth that we eagerly look forward to, he came to suffer and die. All the twinkling lights, all the sweets and sweaters and soirees, all of our celebrations, those are because Jesus was born to be the only sacrifice good enough to take away the guilt of our sin. He became flesh and blood so that his holy flesh could be torn under the whip, 
pierced with the nails of the cross, so that his innocent blood could pour out from his veins as he was lifted up upon the cross to die. This baby laid in the manger on that first Christmas day would be laid out upon the cross on Good Friday, dying a brutal, humiliating, agonizing death to pay the price of your sin. You might feel some pain and discomfort as Jesus cleanses you of your sin, but he experienced the pain of hell because of that same sin. He took it all upon himself. All your guilt, all your shame, all your iniquity, all your wrongdoing, every single transgression, every time you disobeyed God's perfect law, every rebellion and sin that Jesus purged from your life, he carried upon his own innocent shoulders to the cross. And he paid the price you never could. The refiner died under the weight of the dross of your life. The creator suffered and died to redeem the rebellious creation. And because he did, now you have nothing at all to fear when Jesus arrives again. On the cross, Jesus paid the penalty of your sin in full, dying the death that should have been yours forever. And at his grave, Jesus rose again from the dead, giving you not just hope, but the guarantee that you too will rise. Not to another lifetime of sin and temptation and further refinement until you finally get it right. But when this body lies down in the sleep of death, all those who look to Jesus Christ in faith will rise again to sinless perfection, to eternal life in paradise with him who died and rose again to take away your guilt. And so as we eagerly wait to celebrate Jesus' birth, we can also eagerly await his triumphant return when he puts an end to all of our sin and suffering, when death will be no more, when we will be reunited with all those who have died in the one true faith to live in God's glorious presence for all eternity. When that day comes, the pain of our refinement and purification, it will seem like nothing at all compared to the eternal, unimaginable joy of heaven. And yes, as Christians, we really are looking forward to Jesus' arrival. We rejoice that he has come to us in the flesh, in meekness and humility in Bethlehem. We rejoice that he has come into our lives personally to mold and refine us, to burn out the sin that we love so much, to make us pure and holy in a world of sin and depravity. And we rejoice that he will come again as he promised. And when he does, all impurities, all unholiness, all pain and suffering and sin and death will be wiped away completely. And he himself will carry us in his loving arms to that eternal paradise of heaven that he has won for us. So dear Christian, rejoice as Christmas draws near. Celebrate and look forward with anticipation and joy to the arrival of Jesus Christ, both his birth in Bethlehem and his triumphant return on the last day. And do not hesitate to tell the world why, even though it can be painful, you really are looking forward to Jesus' arrival. Because by his cross alone, by his empty tomb alone, you are forgiven of every one of your sins, and eternal life in heaven is yours. To God alone be all glory, now and forever. Amen. And now that peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, you declared Israel to be your people and brought them out of Egypt. You desired their salvation even when they would not listen to your voice. Since you have called and gathered us also to be your people, open our hearts to listen and gladly submit to your word. Purify and refine our lives and lead us to turn away from the sin that seeks to consume us. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you sent John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord, as prophesied by Isaiah, who foretold the Christ. Remember those pastors whom you have called to proclaim your word today. Give them wisdom and courage as they admonish and absolve your people by that word, that your saints might be prepared for Christ's coming again in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you gather your people together in Christ and make them partakers of your grace. Strengthen the faith of those you have gathered into this congregation, that their love may abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment. Lead us to approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, as you call and gather us into your family, so bless the households of this congregation. Bless husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, as they go about their work of strengthening marriage and raising children. Let their love abound more and more with knowledge and discernment and fill their homes with the righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, in the waters of holy baptism, you joined us with you in your death to sin and your resurrection to eternal life. Bless those in our congregation celebrating their baptisms this week, including Betty, Christopher, and Linda. Keep each of us mindful of our baptismal grace and lead us by your Holy Spirit to drown the old sinful Adam within us daily and rise to new life in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord of hosts, be with the leaders and officials of our nation, that they would govern in wisdom, honesty, integrity, and faith. Bless and keep Joe, our president, Kim, our governor, all legislature and judges, and all who make, enforce, and evaluate our laws. Be with the military, police, and all those who put their lives at risk to protect ours. Thwart the plans of those who promote division, wickedness, and chaos, and grant that we would be given a peaceful life in which to worship you without fear. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, we entrust to you all those in need of healing, comfort, consolation, and rescue. Be especially with Leonard, Melissa, Joy, Darren, Kevin, all our shut-ins, and all those we name in our hearts. Have mercy upon them, deliver them according to your will, and strengthen them in the one true faith, that they might be assured of your faithfulness. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy God, by the word of your servant, you prepared all flesh to see the salvation of God. Prepare also the hearts of all who come to your altar today to receive worthily Christ's body and blood, for the forgiveness of their sins. Grant us repentant hearts of faith that we would receive your gracious gifts to our eternal benefit. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Again, a welcome to all of you, and what a joy it is to gather together in God's presence, to know that by our sin we deserve only to be destroyed and judged and condemned for all eternity. But Christ has come to us in mercy and peace to cleanse us of that sin and to give us not just hope, but the guarantee of everlasting life in heaven through his cross and his empty tomb. This week is a very busy week here at Trinity, a lot of different things going on. Uh, this evening, uh, down at Zion, they're having a live nativity uh, walkthrough or drive-through. That begins at 5 o'clock, I believe. 
And then at 6.30 here at Trinity, we are having a youth Christmas concert from youth from the community, from the two churches, from kind of all around the area. Uh, it started out as just a few people that kind of wanted to play some things, and we have just a huge turnout for it. So uh, what a blessing that is. That will be this evening starting at 6.30, and then are there refreshments afterward. That's what everybody was waiting for. So uh, yes, there are Christmas goodies. So uh, join us for that. A free will offering will be taken at that concert to support the North Cedar Clergy Food and Gift Baskets. Uh, that program is going on uh, right now. Um, this Wednesday evening, our Advent services continue as we look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ and the earthly family by which he came to us. Uh, join us for that, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. And then Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, we had planned to finish the Bible study on angels in November, uh, but a lot of questions, a lot of great discussion came up. And so we have one more session of that. That will be this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. Even if you haven't been to the previous ones, feel free to join us for that as we look at what Scripture actually says about angels as opposed to what our culture has to say about them. All sorts of opportunities to gather together in God's presence, many opportunities to hear his word and share in the real meaning of Christmas. So invite your friends and family and neighbors and rejoice that God has come to us in the flesh. God's richest blessings to each and every one of you on the rest of your week, and may he bring you back safely to his holy house in the days and weeks to come.